31. The Conquest of Canaan In 1905, Booth Tarkington, 1869-1946, published his novel, The Conquest of Canaan. A year before, in 1904, Lincoln Steffens, 1866-1936, had published The Shame of the Cities, a study of the link between politics and corruption. This was a subject which the progressives had made a major public issue. The classic study, however, came later with Franklin Hitchborn's The System, as uncovered by the San Francisco Grout Prosecution, 1915. Hitchborn traced in this and other works, notably his series on the California State Legislature, the close working ties between politics, capital, labour and crime. The men who resisted the system were, and are, few, and the penalties for doing so severe. Because of the concern of the progressives, these links became for a time both a matter of news and of public concern. It was soon apparent, however, that information about injustice does not lead to justice. Knowledge is not character nor virtue, nor does knowledge as such give men moral courage. It was in the context of these national concerns that Booth Tarkington wrote The Conquest of Canaan. The title itself expresses a clear faith of sorts, because it implies two things. The story is set in an Indiana city of about 30,000, and the city's name is Canaan. The setting is this devout, conservative, church-oriented Middle America. The first implication of the title is that America is the promised land. As Canaan was the inheritance, the promised land for Israel, so America is a modern promised land, a rich country, a place of milk and honey. The second implication of this title is that some people, who are the chosen people, are seeking to enter that promised land. Some enemies must be dealt with first. The enemies are the ruling class, in particular a wealthy man who rules the town, the court and the press. The chosen people are the lower classes, foreigners, the Irish and Negroes. The hero is an outcast youth who goes to law school and returns to challenge and defeat the system and to inaugurate a new order in Canaan. Justice prevails, Canaan is conquered and the chosen people come into their own. What Booth Tarkington looked for in 1905, but less so in his later years, did come to pass, that is, the triumph of the outcasts and the rise to power of new leaders in the name of the people. But the system not only continues, but is greater in power. Quote Canaan, end quote, The United States has been conquered, in that a new group has seized power from the old Canaanites, but they resemble Sodom and Gomorrah more closely than they do Israel. The United States has seen a dramatic reversal downward in its monetary policies. The old hatreds of race and class have not been healed, but rather often intensified. Both crime and injustice are in the increase to a very high degree, and lawlessness has grown phenomenally. Crime statistics tell a very grim story of the extension of the practice of crime to all classes and to the young. The family order of those years has given way, in non-Christian circles, to promiscuity and an emphasis of major proportions on self-satisfaction rather than responsibility and duty. This change, however, cannot be blamed on the rise of various groups, workers, minorities and like sectors of the nation, to public power, because the same disintegration has marked the older ruling class. The reason instead is, first, the steady de-Christianization of public life, a systematic exclusion of Christianity from education, politics and the media has taken place. At the same time, humanism has become the new established religion informing the laws of the country. 
Second, the evangelical fundamentalist churches have largely abdicated any relevance to the national scene or culture. They are sometimes studied irrelevance, as handed one sphere after another to the humanists. Third, there has been also an increasing moral decay in all social classes and minority groups. Social trends are too often set by the drug culture and other lawless groups and popular quote-unquote rock musical groups have exalted all kinds of assaults on law and morality. Fourth, the middle classes, once the dedicated source of giving whereby Christian causes have been funded, have become more self-indulgent and less generous. Fifth, justice was held by Stephens, Tarkington, Marx and others of diverse views to come from below, from the people. This was a modern form of the old belief in the divine right of kings. Only now the kings who could do no wrong were minority groups, the quote-unquote oppressed and the excluded. In the United States, cabinet members have been ousted for real and imagined invidious comments about such peoples. To seek justice from man is an invitation to evil because man is a fallen creature. Righteousness or justice is the expression of God's being. He cannot be other than just and righteous. We are told, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis chapter 18 verse 25 Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name for ever and ever. Psalm 9 verse 5 God's justice is his action in all his ways. Man's justice is faithfulness to God's law word, the expression of his justice. For men to abandon God's law is to adopt injustice as their way of life. The conquest of Canaan imagined by Tarkington, Stephens and others has been the adoption of one form of injustice to replace another. The Dictionary of Sociology, 1944, defined revolution as a sweeping, sudden change in the societal structure or in some important feature of its Revolutions may occur without violence, for their essence is sudden change. The purpose of revolutions is ostensibly to overthrow evils and to establish justice. But which revolution? French, Russian, Hungarian, Chinese, Cuban, Nicaraguan or Vietnamese has resulted in justice? And what is justice for the humanists? According to Nels Anderson, in the same dictionary, justice, the idea in law by which judges are expected to be guided, that abstract objective which is at best only approximated in the administration of law. This is a definition which is as inclusive of injustice as it is justice. The same dictionary, in a long definition of social justice, defined it as four things. First, a normal birth for every child, plus good food, a liberal education and a healthy environment. Second, a job for everyone, suited to his or her abilities. Third, a good income to enable one to be efficient in his social service. Fourth, influence with the authorities so that a person's ideas are given due consideration. This definition has little to do with right and wrong and much to do with material satisfactions. Modern man, however, views the conquest of Canaan in these terms. Justice is seen as the satisfaction of his beliefs and desires. However, in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, we read, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honourable men are famished, or their glory are men of famine, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure.
and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy, or the holy God, shall be sanctified in righteousness. Death and captivity await the people, says Isaiah, because they are willfully ignorant of God's law. They glory in men of famine, men without God who rule without his law. The holy God must be sanctified in his judgment and righteousness or justice. We have an identification in the interrelationship of knowledge, holiness and justice. None of these can be sought or had outside of God. Any hope of a promised land for mankind in any sphere or by any means apart from the triune God is the road, not to Canaan, but to hell. Men do not want God's Canaan, only their own versions thereof.